Hi everyone. Well, today we are finishing the parables of the kingdom of heaven that are found in Matthew 13. And we're concluding with this one, the parable of the net, which is found from verse 47 through to verse 50. Let's read it together. Once again, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. And this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's confronting. It's the second of the parables that Jesus spoke in Matthew 13 that deals with the theme of judgment. So before we start looking at what God wants to say to us through this story, it's important to put it with the other one that Jesus told so that they can together speak into this theme of judgment. This is the first one and it's called the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Well, a little while later, after they'd left the crowd, Jesus' disciples asked him to explain the parable of the weeds to really understand what Jesus is getting at there. And he answered like this from verse 37. The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did you notice the similarities between those two stories? Let's take a closer look at them as we think about that theme of judgment, which is in Matthew 13. The first uh, idea that we come across is that everyone will be included in a judgment at the end of the age. In the story of the wheat and the weeds, it's talking about that time of harvest where the workers are sent out into the field. In the story of the net, it talks about the process of fishing where a drag net is taken out into a lake. And the way that used to work was typically uh, the net would be attached to a, a pole on the shore. Uh, then the other end would be taken out in a boat and the net would have floats on the top and weights on the bottom so that it covered the whole body of water as uh, it was dragged through the lake. And the, the boat would uh, go through an arc and then come back to shore and then the net would be pulled in and everything that was within that arc that the boat had gone around would be caught up in the net, dragged to the shore and then sorted out. Everything gets included in that judgment at the end of the age. The second idea is this, that the wicked will be cast into the fiery furnace. And both stories use the same imagery, that of the angels separating the wicked from the righteous. And it says that they will be thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But then the last idea is this one, that the righteous, in contrast, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. But interestingly, this idea is contained in only one of those stories, the wheat and the weeds. Jesus, as he's bringing all his parables of the kingdom to a close, doesn't actually talk about the fate of the righteous in his last story. He emphasizes the fate of the wicked. And how do you feel as you see that? How do you feel as you look at that and as you think about that? Are you comfortable with it? 
How much are you willing to talk about these ideas that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 13? Jesus, the most compassionate, loving person the world has ever known, talked more about the judgment of the wicked than he did about the reward of the righteous. In fact, he speaks more about hell, the fate of the wicked, than any other person in the Bible. He speaks more about it than the Apostle Paul or any of the other apostles. He speaks more about it than any of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus really made it a priority to warn people of the consequences of choosing wickedness over righteousness. And that's uncomfortable stuff to talk about. It's uncomfortable to think about. If you like thinking about this kind of stuff, there's, to be frank, something wrong with you in your attitude toward others. Despite the unpleasant nature, though, of thinking about the fate of the wicked, Jesus did not shy away from this subject, and neither should we. We should bring all of our doubts, all of our feelings, all of our complaints and questions to God and allow him to shine his truth into our questions. If we're willing to be honest about the tension that we feel, if we're willing to be honest about the fact that we'd rather not think about this, um, we can bring that to God and allow him to speak into it. We don't escape problems by ignoring them. We need to come to God and allow him to speak to this issue of hell, this issue of judgment upon the wicked. As we prepare ourselves, though, to think about what the Bible has to say on this topic, I want to tune into the way Jesus continued the conversation with his disciples. He says to them, have you understood all these things? And they replied, yeah, we have. And then he goes on to say this, Therefore, every teacher of the law who's been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Jesus is informing us that there is this huge storehouse of precious life-changing truth contained in the Old Testament scriptures. And he's not wanting to replace those. He's not wanting for us to ignore those. He wants us to continue to bring out those truths, but he's completing them. He's adding to that body of truth that God has given us by which we can understand everything that we need to know about life and godliness, everything that we need to know about this life and the next. So as we prepare ourselves to think more about judgment, we want to do exactly what Jesus is encouraging us to do in this short story. We want to bring out old treasures as well as new and really build a good foundation to understand this issue of judgment. So let's dive into doing that together. There's some key ideas about judgment that the Bible wants to give us that build a foundation for us to be able to handle our questions, our concerns, how we feel about the reality of God's judgment upon the wicked as well as upon the righteous. And I'm going to move through those foundational ideas. Uh, The diagram at the bottom is something that if you've been with us over recent weeks, you will have seen. I will refer to that as we go through. Um, But if you've been here over the last six weeks or so, you'll have a bit of an advantage in knowing what that picture is all about. But let's dive into those key ideas the Bible has for us about judgment. And the first is this. Judgment separates good from evil and right from wrong. Those parables both spoke about the separation of the righteous and the wicked at the end of the age when Jesus comes to judge. And the laws that God has given us to live by, as we read his word, those laws are all about filling our lives with goodness and guarding our lives against evil, against wickedness. It's about separating good and evil and choosing the good, not the evil. Even in creation, God gave only what was good. He kept evil separate from our reality. It was Adam's choice in rebelling against God that allowed evil into our world. And from that time onward, ever since he made the decision to be like God himself and make his own choices about what's good and evil, we haven't had the capacity to make good judgments. We've allowed evil and good to coexist together. That's the story of our experience of life. From that moment, from the moment Adam chose, good and evil have been mixed together in our world. And that leads us to the second principle, which is this. God's the perfect judge. We're not. 
God's perfect in knowledge. He's perfect in goodness. He is the very definition of love. And that's something we really need to keep in mind whenever we don't agree with what God says or what he does. We're not perfect in knowledge. We don't know all the facts in any situation in life, including even in what motivates us. Not only do we not know everything, we're not perfectly good. We're not morally perfect the way God is. And we're not perfectly loving the way God is. We are self-interested. We are loyal to some more than others. God is perfectly loving. And because we're not perfect in knowledge or goodness or love, there will be some times when our judgments are different to God's. It takes a lot of faith and humility to trust his judgments over our own. And if you want to test this theory, just take the rules for life that God has given us in his word, or even better, read the Gospels and see the way that Jesus himself lived as the perfect embodiment of God's judgment of what is good and what is not. When you see the way Jesus lived, you realize that his way of living is better for everyone. His way of living is truly good. And boy, don't I wish that I was able to live the way that Jesus lived. He is an example of this reality that God is the perfect judge. God knows what is good and what is evil, and he can be trusted in his judgments. But the third reality is this. God can handle our questions and our wrestling. God is not a distant authoritarian figure as we sometimes imagine judges to be. He is our heavenly father. Unlike earthly fathers, he does a perfect job of that too. And a good parent is a good coach. They're willing to explain the decisions they make. They don't want children who just robotically do what they've been programmed to do. I know in my household that might make life a little bit simpler at times, but it's not what I want for my kids. I want them to grow in their capacity to make good judgments as well. The book in the Bible that was probably the first one that was actually written down was the book of Job. And it's all about Job wrestling with the goodness of God's treatment of him. He doesn't think God's judgment and what God is allowing is fair and right and good. And God's really patient with Job as Job wrestles with God on this issue. But in the end, the response is like this. Job, I am dealing with much bigger realities than you can comprehend. You're going to need to trust me. And Job responds in faith and in worship to God. And God is ultimately proven to be both right and good in the story. And the same thing happens in the book of Habakkuk, uh, where the prophet Habakkuk complains because God's not doing anything to get rid of the evil stuff going on in his nation. And you've probably felt the same. When you see evil things going on, and we see them uh, sometimes repeated over social media or news channels uh, where incidents have been caught on film, and you, you wonder, why doesn't God do something to prevent that from happening? Why does God allow evil to flourish? And Habakkuk complains to God and says, God, why aren't you judging this stuff? You're supposed to be the perfect judge. And God replies to his prophet and says, well, actually, I am going to send the Babylonians to punish the evil in the nation that is concerning you. And then Habakkuk complains again and says, the Babylonians, they're worse than us. How can you punish us and not punish them? And we've probably felt that way too. Why is it that sometimes it feels unfair in who gets punished and who doesn't get punished? Who flourishes and who doesn't flourish? In the end, uh, God has this conversation with Habakkuk, uh, who is able to come to a point of being able to see what God is doing, again, to respond in faith and in worship. And I know many people who have turned their backs on Christianity because they've had concerns with the fairness of a God who could throw people into hell or why God allows evil things to continue in this world. The same questions that Habakkuk was wrestling with. And what God wants us to do is to bring those questions to him, to wrestle with him so that he can bring us to that point of being able to understand what he is doing in the world. Not necessarily to know all the answers, just like he did with Job. Sometimes he'll have to say, you won't get everything that I'm doing. You will have to trust me. But like a loving father, he longs to explain and to help us grow in our relationship with him and our ability to trust him and worship him for his goodness. There's one other guy who took 
his questions and in fact his complaints to God about his justice. His name was Jonah. And his story illustrates this next truth, that God's justice is always paired with his mercy. God's justice is always paired with his mercy. What is justice? Well, justice is getting exactly what we deserve. Not better than we deserve, not worse than we deserve. Justice is getting exactly what we deserve. And we call it injustice if we don't get some good things that we have earned or if we get something bad that we haven't deserved. What do we call it when we don't get the just punishment that we do deserve? Well, that's called mercy. And Jonah was sent by God to announce judgment on the wicked city of Nineveh. And Jonah hated those guys. So you'd think he'd be raring to go, to go and announce to these guys that God was going to justly punish them for their sins. But he ran away. He didn't want to go. Why is that? Because he knew that in the slim chance that the people of Nineveh listened and responded and turned from their wicked ways, he knew that God loved to give mercy more than he loves to give justice. And he didn't want the Ninevites to receive the mercy of God. And that's what God had to deal with Jonah about. God wanted Jonah to see his heart. God wants Jonah and you and I to understand that both justice and mercy flow from the same heart of love. Love burns against evil. Love can't stand wicked things that go on in the world and hurt people. But love also longs to rescue people from evil, to not treat people according to what they deserve, even when they chose it for themselves. God's justice is always paired with his mercy. And when you go through the storyline of the Bible, this theme repeats over and over and over again. We can bring out all of those treasures from the storehouse of God's word that illustrate this principle. In the story of creation and then the fall, God justly judged Adam and Eve for letting sin into the world. He cast them out of the garden. He made them mortal. He imposed consequences on them for their rebellion against him. But in his mercy, those consequences were limited. Those consequences were aimed at teaching them the futility of their sin. And even as he imposed consequences, he also promised a deliverer. His justice and his mercy were acting together. When God judged the world in the time of Noah, it was full of ingrained violence and wickedness. And God justly cleansed the earth of all that wickedness. But mercifully, he spared one family to give the world a fresh start. When God judged the wickedness of Israel, just as he was speaking to Habakkuk about, by sending them into exile in a foreign land, he also mercifully brought them back into the land that he had given them. He restored them. He took away the consequences that they had earned for themselves. And over and over again, those Old Testament scriptures show the beauty of God's justice and his mercy. But they're not yet complete. They're not yet enough. Some new treasures are needed to finish the collection. See, justice and mercy are always in tension as God deals with a fallen world. He can't be perfectly just and give us exactly what we deserve, while at the same time being perfectly merciful and not giving us what we deserve. They are in tension, in competition with one another until you get to Jesus. God made his justice and his mercy perfect in Jesus. In John chapter 8, we read a story of how some religious people are putting a woman to death for the sin of adultery. And they're right, sexual sin messes up God's good world. We're better off without it. They're also wrong because they don't seem to be anywhere near as concerned about their own sins and the just punishment for their own sins. Jesus comes alongside her. He protects her from the judgment of that crowd. He has mercy on her and tells her to go and sin no more. And Jesus copped a fair bit of flack from religious leaders of his day. And I think they thought that he was soft on sin. <clears throat> was that the case? Was God being soft on sin in Jesus? Absolutely not. Jesus knows that he is headed toward the cross. His body will be beaten torn and pierced. His relationship with his father will be broken for a time. 
He will take the just punishment for our sins so that God's perfect justice will be satisfied and perfect mercy can be offered. I want you to imagine Jesus squatting down in the dirt next to that woman, protecting her from the blows of those rocks that they were going to throw at her. He announces that she's free from condemnation. He urges her to leave her life of sin. But as he spares her body from the blows that she has earned, he has in mind that he can be perfectly merciful to her because he will be perfectly just for her. He will take the punishment her sins deserve so that he can offer her the mercy that she does not deserve. And that's exactly how God deals with you and I today. I've often spoken with Christians who wonder if God is punishing them for something that they've done or not done. And we need to be really clear about that. The Bible emphasizes for us that God is like a perfect father. He does discipline us for our good. He does train us, sometimes using hardships to do that. He has left us in a world in which evil still exists, and that's painful for us at times. He's done this for the sake of his mission to let other people know about the opportunity to receive his mercy. But God does not punish us for our sins either in this life or the next. God's justice is perfectly satisfied in Jesus. No sin, past, present or future, remains for you to be punished for. Jesus took it all. God is not angry with you. He will not punish you. He will not condemn you in this life or the next if you have received through faith the gift of Jesus taking the punishment that you deserve. He has satisfied God's justice perfectly on your behalf. Perfect mercy is yours as a result. And so this story of the Bible, right up until the time of final judgment, prepares us to understand what final judgment will be like. And so our final point concerns that moment of judgment when Jesus returns to judge the world. God's final judgment will perfectly and permanently separate good from evil. This is the focus of the parable of the net and the parable of the wheat and the weeds that we read in Matthew 13. There will be a time when God will perfectly and permanently separate good from evil. And this is an outcome that is both glorious and terrible. For those, for those who have already received God's perfect justice taken on their behalf by Jesus, now they get to receive the fullness of God's mercy. It is perfected. We won't have to put up with the presence of sin in our lives anymore. The curse is broken. Bondage is broken. The world is made anew. Our relationship with God and his people is now completely untainted by sin. Every insecurity gives way to unshakable confidence. Every hurt is healed. Every destructive habit is broken. Every good thing that we've ever experienced in life will then seem like a shadow of the glorious things which we will now experience. We will be eternally grateful that Jesus has separated good from evil. And that's why Jesus in the book of Romans is called the second Adam. When Adam made his choice, he inherited a world from God as a gift that was completely good. He allowed evil to come in. He wanted to be able to choose what he wanted to do. And ever since that time, the world has experienced both good and evil. Jesus, the second Adam, also makes a choice, but his choice is not to let evil into the world. His choice is to take evil out. And this is great news for all of those who are looking forward to an existence where only good remains. It's really, really bad news for those who have rejected the offer of the kingdom of heaven, eternal life in Jesus. What are you left with? What happens when there is no reprieve from your insecurities? What happens when there's no healing for your hurts? 
What happens when there's no strength to resist destructive habits or there's no protection against the actions of others? These and many more are just the natural consequences of an existence without the presence of good in your life. Add to that the fact that God will justly punish all those for the evil deeds that they have committed. It's no wonder that Jesus uses the imagery of weeping and gnashing teeth to symbolize the intense emotional anguish of realizing that you are left with an experience for all eternity where you no longer have anything good to look forward to, anything good to experience. He speaks of a fiery furnace symbolizing the permanence of that choice. There's no coming back from this. There is no plan B for receiving the mercy of God. It's expressed in Jesus. It is received now. So what should we do as a result of understanding that there is a final judgment to come, which will perfectly and permanently separate good from evil? Well, as we wrap up, I want to suggest to you three simple things that you can do in response to these biblical principles about judgment that we've talked about today. The first is simply this, to receive God's good gift of eternal life through Jesus. Jesus spoke often about the reality of God's judgment on the wicked, not because he enjoyed the topic, but because he didn't want anybody to experience that outcome. He offers freely eternal life. He paid the price necessary for us to enjoy only goodness for all eternity. Please don't turn your back on that. The consequences of rejecting that offer are terrible. That's why Jesus spoke so much about it. So please, would you receive from God his good gift of eternal life through Jesus? The second outcome of thinking about judgment surely must be if you've received the gift of eternal life through Jesus, if you've believed his message, we've got to share it with others. What kind of person can look forward to heaven yet not want to share it with those that they are around in this life, that those they have the opportunity of rescuing? We need to be willing to share it with others. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Is it daunting? Yes. But is it critically important? Yes. We need to be willing to share these truths with others. But the last response to the themes of judgment in the Bible I suggest is this. Bring your questions and your complaints. Just like the three guys that we mentioned earlier in the message, God can handle our questions and complaints and often we need to bring those in order to be able to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus. There may be some issues that you need to wrestle through as you think about whether God is indeed good, whether he can be trusted, whether you can bring yourself to want to worship him as your God. Those questions are okay. Bring them to God. Wrestle through them with him. You might have received God's gift of eternal life, but you might lack the confidence in being able to share that with others because you're not sure how you'll respond to the questions that other people have. Well, let's wrestle with those questions together. So next Sunday, we're going to devote our teaching time in our online service purely to answering the questions that you have about final judgment. We've laid a foundation this week. We've brought out some old and new treasures from the Bible that equip us to deal with this subject well. But there are many more questions that can be asked. So we're going to do that next week. And I would invite you, submit those questions during this week. Send me an email. Use the contact info on the website. Uh, put a comment on the Facebook post. Whatever you need to do, and whatever works for you in order to get your question through, we want to be able to address it and wrestle through those next week so that we can do these things well. We can be people who receive God's gift of eternal life. We can grasp it confidently because we've wrestled with God's truth. And we're people who are able to share that truth with others. Again, because we've done the work of really allowing God to speak to us so that we may trust him and worship him in this life and in the next. God bless you. Well, that's a really confronting topic. 
And the most important thing that we can do whenever we deal with one of those difficult issues is to come to God and ask him to do the work that only he can do in our minds to understand it, in our hearts to be willing to receive it. So will you join with me and pray? God, we want to thank you that these truths are about judgment are in your word. They're not easy to read. They're confronting. They're difficult. They make an impact on us. We're all affected uh, by the relationships that we have with people who we know who have not accepted eternal life in Jesus. And it's difficult for us to contemplate what that means for them. God, thank you that you can minister to us in the midst of that sorrow and that grief. Thank you that you can reassure us that you are a perfect judge and you always do what is right and that you are the embodiment of love. You are the definition of love. And everything you do comes out of your love for us. So as we wrestle with the questions that we have about judgment this week, and there are many questions that we might ask, would you help us to apply these six principles that we've talked about today? Lord, we don't want anyone to perish. And thank you that because you don't want anyone to perish, you have left your church in this world to make the offer of salvation. You have held off the day of judgment so that others may come in. Lord, may we make full use of this time. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.